In 2017, I started a 3D printing business from home, and by 2020, I had scaled it to over six figures. Then COVID hit, my income fell a little bit, so I decided to automate most of the process, and I've now automated it to the point where I only have to spend about two to four hours a week on custom jobs at home. Want to learn how I did it? So don't forget to hit that like button, smash that subscribe button, and join me on this fantastic printing voyage. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Christopher Morton. I'm the one that runs this channel, Automated Income Lifestyle. And what I'm about to show you in this video series, this right here is my first attempt at automation. This was the first thing that I had ever automated away from me. So even though this video will, series will outline how I automated it, this is actually bigger than that. I'm going to show you how to identify the best product for you to make and sell, as well as giving you some examples of some niches, just to give you an idea springboard. 3D design tools that even a toddler can use, and then keeping it very simple, a shipping software out there that is free and just as good as all the paid services, which is actually how I automated my business, and I will explain that later. Because you're like, wait a minute, shipping software? How did that automate anything? I will show you. In this first video for this series, we are going to talk about how to select a product and how to find your market. Necessity is the mother of invention. And I've included that quote for a very valuable reason. When I started this, I was not a 3D printing hobbyist looking for a product that I could sell. I started from a completely different angle. And I think that there's a lot of people out there who are literally at the brink of this angle but maybe don't have the money to pay for a 3D designer and think the whole thing is so complex that it stifles their idea. So I wanted to show you how to manifest that idea. In 2016, there was a newly forming niche that needed cigar molds. I was starting out in the cannabis industry and we needed a product and I stumbled onto cannabis cigars made with traditional tobacco cigar molds and I was just mind blown. I knew immediately that I wanted to get into that, to kind of master that, and to push that. And so my primary business, Canagar Tools, is the thing that turned into Six Figures, which is a brand and a tool set that I created, and 3D printing happened to be perfect for this particular tool. All the existing tools at the time were available in very specific sizes, usually for big tobacco cigars, but we needed much smaller sizes. We needed an array of different shapes and things like that. And I was contacting cigar mold companies. I was finding wooden molds and things I could have and made online, uh, kind of in limited quantity. But wood had problems, you know, totally separate from this video. And plastic turned out to be okay, but it was going to cost me close to 10 grand per order to get just one size to test because of their minimum orders. So I found a specific niche in which 3D printing applied perfectly and would allow me to create all the sizes that I needed. And what actually ended up happening to me is everyone around me who was part of that niche wanted my tools, so I started selling them. And then after that, I launched a website, and kind of the rest is history. So my specific example is an industry that had a problem, a particular need, and finding a way that 3D printing would fulfill that need. I purchased a 3D printer for myself to make the tools that I needed. I had zero experience in 3D design, meaning I didn't know CAD. I didn't know any of that stuff. I got my printer and I instantly had a problem. How do I make something that I want to make? Can't I just print and sell the 3D models that I find online on Thingiverse? No. There are laws against it. Even though those models are freely available, most of them are not commercially available. Some of them are. You have to read into the licensing, but for the most part, you're not going to be able to start a store just freely printing what's available. It's also going to be hard to start up a service. You're competing with monstrous size businesses. And unfortunately, it's going to be really hard to get an edge on your competition if you're just offering 3D printing as a service outside of a, a very trustworthy word of mouth network. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but that is not what I did. This is why I recommend going niche. This will ultimately be 
what builds your business, what builds your reputation. And later on, you can even approach different 3D printing partners, show them the business and the demand for your product, and you can then leverage deals with those businesses like I have to take it off your hands if you want to do that one day. But look for a market that has a need, but also has a problem fulfilling that need. Then do some research and find out if 3D printing would be a viable option for fulfilling that need. I cannot stress this enough. Ideally, this need will be found in an industry connected to a hobby that you are already passionate about. The more you can be an authority on something beyond just the printed part, this will make everything so much easier. If you can find a way to apply 3D printing to something that is already in your life that you are an authority about, you will be able to push this without even trying. I had a need. And it turns out that the industry that I wanted to get into also had this need. 3D printing turned out to be not only a viable option, but to really be perfect for what I was trying to accomplish, which was an assortment of different sizes and shapes made to order in any quantity so that I could empower people to actually research and develop on different products without having to pay these exorbitant minimums to get new sizes and shapes. I've prepackaged a few options that you might investigate. Uh, I think these apply to lots of different people out there. OEM replication car parts. There's all sorts of different cars out there where parts are really hard to find or they're just very, very expensive. I've got a buddy, a Honda guy, who's requested that I've made several parts for him. And, you know, if you're out there and you're a car guy, this might be a perfect niche for you to sniff on and find the right thing for you and run with it. Another idea might be video game accessories or VR headset accessories. This is another example where if you already have a hobby and you're very into something, think to yourself, what is it that I want? What do I need? Is there something that I could have right now that would either make my experience better, augment or enhance my experience? What could that be? You might have the answer to what product you want already, and now you need to make it. Another example might be making custom orthotics or prosthetics. This is definitely a little bit more advanced, but I mean the imagination is your limit here. There is no limit to the way you can enhance or make more useful through intuitive design and having access to tools that allow you to rapidly prototype and manifest those ideas into reality. Pet prosthetics might be your gateway into human prosthetics. Certainly it would be true that it'll be a lot easier to take something to market and actually find a viable way to sell it without the regulatory burdens that you might have with human prosthetics. And look at some of these things. These are both 3D printed examples and they look amazing. This kind of stuff you can make at home and enhance people's lives, enhance people's pets' lives, really serve a purpose that makes you feel good inside. That concludes the first video in this series. I hope it has helped you a lot and served as a great idea springboard for you to flesh out your product idea. If you like this channel, don't forget to like and subscribe. It'll help me keep making videos in the future. Stay tuned for the second video in this series where I'm going to show you what I consider to be the easiest 3D design software known to man. I just had somebody reach out through a YouTube comment and clue me in on something that I had no idea about, and I am very disappointed this morning, guys. That app, that wonderful app that I made a video about a few months ago to try to show people that 3D design doesn't have to be intimidating or hard, they just discontinued it. And it's actually a huge kick in the nuts for my business, and I wanted to explain why. When other 3D designers ask what I use, I would tell them Morphe, and I would literally say, this is my secret weapon. And it was. It's the only way that I can do custom work for free and only charge for the physical tools. First off, don't think this means that you can't get started or that it's going to be hard and you shouldn't do it. There are still ways. I was using Fusion 360 before I discovered Morphe, so it's totally possible. However... I don't know of another app like Morphe that allowed me to work so fast. It's going to make two big changes to the way I handle custom 3D design jobs. One, I'm only going to do material and color customizations for free. If they want custom design tools, they're going to have to pay for that labor. Just to give you an idea, with my cigar molds, 
if I were to make a custom cigar mold, not just, you know, the actual custom molds using the same body frame, but if I have to recreate the entire thing from scratch, like I did with a custom order I recently received, this dude wanted like 13 custom tools and wanted to change everything you can think of about them. Each mold would take me like an hour to design in Morphe, but in Fusion 360, we're talking three or four hours. So... This one guy's custom order, a recent one, was like 13 custom molds, all highly customized. It only took me about one day, maybe about a 10-hour day, of sitting there to design all of those molds and then get them cranking on my 3D printers. So I did the 3D design work for free, as I've always done, and only charged for the tools. Now that same work would require me sitting down almost for an entire week in my software, and I'm not willing to do that for free. So I'm basically shutting down physical alterations in my custom shop. If people ask about it, I might be willing, but I will have to charge them for my design time. Morphe was designed as an iPad app. So first, it had to be simple for the touch interaction. Two, it was originally made for kids, and then they just kept making it better until it became a professional software. For those reasons, I don't know of another app right now that I would equate with Morphe or say, yeah, I'm jumping to this. If you know of any software, please drop me a recommendation. I would love to know. And if I find another software that will enable the same kind of custom work that I was doing, giving me the fastest turnaround times in my entire industry, then I'll make another video about it and I'll definitely start posting. I was really looking forward to making a bunch more lessons about Morphe and kind of digging into it. But unfortunately, that will be the last of my Morphe lessons. On the hunt for new software, as of today. Thanks to a recommendation left by a commenter on one of my videos, ChrisHead2391, thank you very much. I think I might have found a viable software to replace Morphe. Let's check it out. Open up your web browser and go to Shaper3D.com, which is... S-H-A-P-R-3-D.com and then you'll want to click over on the right at sign up and create yourself an account. You do have the ability to create like I think one or two projects for free before you'd have to upgrade to a build plan. So I'm evaluating that right now. I'm going to try to build one of my cigar mold templates from scratch and you guys are going to watch. Then let's download the software. You will click on product, 3D modeling, and download Shaper 3D. Choose the platform that you're working on. I'm working on Mac. Save, and then you'll run the installer. Let's skip past that, and I'm going to launch the app. So now I'm starting from scratch. Let's make this full screen so I can work in it a little easier. And what I'm going to do now, I know the basic dimensions of one half of my cigar mold, and we're going to put that down first as lines. So I'm going to draw right here. So that says 10 inches. I only want it to be five and a half. There we go. That should work. Now I want to draw another line starting there. So I've created a rectangular shape with the dimensions that I want. Now I want to do an extrusion to bring it into 3D reality. All right. So I changed to the transform tool and it automatically selected the extruder. See this set of arrows right here? I'm going to pull up and there I'm creating a block. Let's do 0.75. That'll do. So one thing that I really like about this software, when I first set it up and I didn't walk you through that, it asks you to set up how you want your controls and it allowed me to select trackpad gestures which is immensely helpful to me because I love being able to do things like when I put my two fingers down now I can rotate the object when I hold shift and then move my fingers now I'm moving around the object so very easy to manipulate this kind of like Morphe was zoom into it and I'm using the pinch gesture pinching out and pinching in to zoom all right, so what I want to do now, I round my corners. And in order to do that, I went through a tutorial when I first launched the software, by the way, that taught me this. See how I can select the very corner and it selects just that line? Well, what I'm going to do, it didn't teach me this in the tutorial, but I think I can select all four corners and manipulate them at the same time. Watch, I'm going to select this and see how an arrow appears? What we can do is drag outward to create a rounded corner or drag inward to create 
just kind of a chopped off corner. I want a rounded corner and I actually want to do all four corners at the same time. So let me see if I can do that. I do believe I can. I'm going to select that corner and I'm going to rotate around, hold shift, click. Okay, yes, you can see that one selected and that one. And then I'm just going to keep rotating around until I get all four corners selected, holding shift every time I select. And now this one arrow, if I'm right, should manipulate all four corners. Boom, and it does. So now I'm getting an equal, equal curvature on all four corners. There we go, a rounded corner rectangle. And now I need to do some copying and subtractions to turn this puppy into a cigar mold. So now I have half of my cigar mold and I need to duplicate this puppy so that I have two halves of a cigar mold. See if I can figure that out. I'll want to select the entire thing somehow. Right click, there we go, select all. I wonder what mirror does. Oh, there we go. It looks like mirror is going to create two different pieces. So I'm going to click done. Now the big question, are these actually independent? Yes, they are. Oh, and look over here. I've got two different objects. So body one, body zero one. I bet I can title those right here. Lower body and upper body. How do I move these independently? So how do I... How do I select that puppy and move it? So probably move, rotate. Let's see if, well, it's not just as simple as click and drag. Okay, so that that allows me to move it in space when I select the move up. I don't want to stretch it. It's going to take some getting used to these controls. I can tell. Move, rotate. Well, wait a minute, look at that, that's wacky. So that's moving just the face of the object, not the whole object. That's interesting. So I'm gonna do the same thing I did a second ago and do select all, but it selected both of them. I only wanna select all of this one object. Now I'm gonna have to figure out how to do that. So it looks like what I need to do over here on the side where I have the items that I named, I can select the entire object. And now when I move it, I'm free to move it on any axis with these arrows. So okay, that'll do. Let's say I want these to be both sitting at the same level. I wonder how I do that. Like is there a, there's gotta be some way to align. So it looks like what I'm going to do over here in my menu, I'm going to select transform and then align. And then it wants me, I think, to select the object that I want to align with. And I get this green arrow and I'm going to select next. You rotate this around. It's up here it says select face or edge to align, select target face or edge, and drag to snap points. So let's see if I drag you know, the center of this to the center of this. Hmm. I mean, it's not quite what I wanted, but that will do for, for what I want to use it for. So I want to click done. Okay. So then now they're in alignment. That's basically two halves of my cigar mold. I need to change the dimensions so that this one is just a little bit shorter. So this one is 0 0.75. I'm going to make this one on top 0.70. Or no, point, uh, 0.65. So I'm going to drag it down and that changes the extrusion. Or I can change this little number manually. 0.65. So now this, two different widths. We've got one that's slightly thinner than the other. And now I need to duplicate this again. Surely there's got to be another way other than mirror. But for right now, I'm going to use that as my workaround. I'm going to select the upper body. And then I'm going to go to mirror again. I'm going to select this. It mirrors another piece. There we go. And then I'm going to take what I just made. So it should have two upper buddies. Yep, there's the copied one. And I'm going to title this Cutaway. Because in a second, I'm going to use this piece to subtract away a space that I need to recess. On these cigar molds, the bottom half will have a recess cutaway into it. And the top half will have kind of an extrusion that fits into the cutaway. That way they stack together and kind of lock nice and tight. 
So let's see. I need to change the dimensions of this puppy to something that makes sense. I don't have my specs in front of me right now, so I'm just going to do it on the fly for this presentation. I don't want to scale it. I've already kind of learned scaling only works. It's like 100% and then either direction which isn't exactly what I want in this case. I want to be able to manually change by millimeters. That was called offset. Okay, offset face. So I'm going to offset this face on the side, I believe. And yep, that's it. I'm gonna drag it in. Yep, that'll do. I'm not being exact here, but I'm just giving you an idea of how I would create this. I'm going to select my offsets. And yes, you can manually enter them. So when I get my specs later, I should be able to get everything centered and good to go. A little bit more. And if the view kind of gets weird on you like it is now with me, I'm going to zoom out and then I'm going to use the shift key to realign and then I'm going to pinch zoom and zoom back in and it helps you get a, a cleaner perspective on what you're working with. Now to show you what I want to do, I only need this to be about tenth of an inch, maybe a little bit taller for me to cut it away properly. So I'm going to change the offset I want to do. This actually requires two pieces, one to cut away and one to merge, and they have to be slightly different sizes. So I'm gonna take this piece right here that I've titled Cutaway, and I'm going to, I guess, use mirror again to duplicate it since I'm not quite sure if there's another way. Mirror, boom, I've duplicated it. Now I'm going to select my second cutaway that I just made and I'm going to title it Extrusion. I'm going to select that all together and now I'm going to move it out of my way. I'm going to make sure that I resize it though. So this one will be the cutaway and I need for the extrusion piece to be slightly smaller. And it has to be slightly smaller, not by a random value, but by a very specific dimension. Based on the plastic that I'm using, the settings on my printer and in my slicer, I know from experience that I need my cutaway to be 0.5 millimeters larger than the extrusion that's going to inset into it. So over here on the one that I have that's going to be my extrusion, I'm going to select the face and I'm going to see what the, it's 129.5. Let me select this face and it's 121.99. So yeah, that's pretty damn close anyway. I'm going to do 122, and now they're exactly 0.5 millimeters. So this means this one is 0.5 millimeter smaller in this dimension. Now I need to change on this axis. So let's see, 119.37. And over here we've got one, okay, so, so I'm gonna do 119. Boom, and on this one, 119.50. Visually, I can't really tell, but we'll, we'll leave that alone for now, and I'm going to do what I need to do. In order for this to work for my purposes, I have to create two more of these rectangles, shrink them a bit, and then join them together. So this is something unique to cigar molds. Let me see if I can figure out how to do this. Raise that. Copy. So that was just doing mirror. And I actually figured this out a few seconds ago. You're seeing me do redo. <laughs> so I undid all the way back here. And now I'm just going to redo. So I copied that piece. Then I wanted to manipulate how big it was to create a tongue section. I sunk it down to where they were both level with each other. And I'm pulling it out. And I'm straightening these pieces to get them aligned just right. And then I did a copy. So now I've got two of these pieces. I no longer need this over here. So a few seconds, I'm going to delete that puppy. And now what I have to do is change the size just a little bit and align them. So as you can see, I've got a little extra space on the bottom. And now I need to get that same little extra space up top. So I'm going to select my extrusion piece. 
Let's drop it down and see if it fits snug as a bug in a rug. Zoom in and you can see I want the bottom to be just a little bit bigger by 0.5 millimeter approximately all the way around. And the reason I'm doing that, I'm going to cut the bottom piece out of the bottom of the mold and I'm going to join this piece to the top of the mold. So it creates an extrusion on the underside of this piece right here and a recess on the other piece. And so it looks like we're pretty much there. And this is some wasted space right here. I think I'm going to get rid of that. Let's see if I've got them aligned the way I want to. That certainly looks interesting back there. So they're not centered the way I want them to be. I'm going to select the upper body, the extrusion. I'm going to raise it a little bit. And then what I want to do is an alignment. And I've kind of figured this out. To do an alignment, I select the item that I want to align. I select the align tool. And then I've got to select the face I want to align. There's my center point, And I'm going to connect it to the center point on this object below it so that it will pull into center alignment with it. Boink. And now you can see that fixed the end so that the bottom is poking out just a little over the edge. Oops. I lost my view. I'm going to go ahead and click Done. Had to do a quick search on the Shaper 3D website. If you ever lose sight of your object like I have, you can click on this little square up in the corner, double click, and it brings you back to a close view of your project. And these are now ready, but I need to change their placement. So I'm going to grab both of the extrusion and the cutaway, and then I need to change their position slightly. So I'm going to grab them. So I'm going to go ahead and roll with that. And what I'm going to do now, let's grab the other piece over there, the upper body. And I want to move that back over here. I want to... There we go. Now I need to center them. I'm going to take the center point on that one and I'm going to try to align it to the center point on the bottom face of the other one. So let's select the upper body. Let's go to align, select the lower face, center. All right. So that centered them even though it pulled it to the bottom. And what I can do now, I'm going to click done and then I'm going to select the upper body and I'm going to drag it upwards back to where I wanted it because they're aligned properly now I just need to put them where they need to be and so you can kind of see what I'm going to be building right now put the extrusion piece move it upward I want it to intersect these two slightly so I can join them together so that's almost done now let's cut away so I'm going to go to the cutaway I'm going to sink it down I was having kind of this problem earlier because it's snapping too and I need to sink it down further. And I'm going to have to figure out how to do that exactly because it's not going flush exactly like I want it to. In any case, for the purposes of this tutorial, I will just go ahead and cut these away so you can see. So I'm going to do my cutaway first. And to do that, I'm going to select the lower body. Then I'm going to go to subtract and I'm going to select the cutaway and you can see what it's going to do. It's going to leave that part cut away. I'm going to say done and now we've got the lower part. Oh and I can see they weren't totally even because we've got a little bit of an uneven plane here. So I might need to go in and fix that uh, for my later on part get those completely even with each other. Still haven't figured everything out yet but all right, so now I want to join the extrusion with the top. So I'm going to do extrusion and let's do upper body. And there is a union option. And I'm not sure if this is the best way to join objects because they're still technically separated. Like you can see, I can select everything separately still, but they move around and you can see it condense them into one object. But that's that. And then you can see they kind of fit together like a glove and the last part is I need to cut off this tongue because I no longer need it which to do that I would typically create a shape and subtract it I think I can do that here just by doing a 
let's see, upper body, let's duplicate it real quick, which again, I only know how to do that via mirror at the moment. So I'm gonna roll with what I can do. And I've got upper body number one that I can select. Watch what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna take this puppy right over to the face. I'm gonna sink it down to where it cuts off that. Let's change that because I want it to be bigger and I want it to leave no mistakes. So I'm going to do that and then I'm gonna drag that out. It looks a little bit ridiculous, but you'll see why in a second. I want it to smoothly cut away the entire face of this cigar mold. And I'm even gonna take the upper body and lower body. I'm gonna move them into the center. There we go. So this is, I mean, what I'm doing right now, the manipulations I'm doing are very similar to the way I would do that in Morphe. And if somebody has a better way and I'm like going the kindergarten stupid way, please feel free to let me know in the comments. I'm always open and open to learning. This whole 3D design was kind of flying by the seat of my pants when I first got started. So I'm going to select that upper body and I'm going to drag over just a little. Hopefully... That'll do. Now let's do a subtract. So select the upper body and the lower body and subtract. All right, so that kind of did what I wanted. And you can see it made these two things totally equal. And that's how the front of my cigar mold will meet. Hopefully this is now an object I can select on its own. Let's delete. And there we go. I've got one cigar mold template. What I have to do now would be to put my bolt holes in it, which would probably be a matter of making cylinders. Let's see. I'm going to take these two pieces, lower them. Surely there's got to be a snap to grid or some kind of function like that so I don't end up going below the grid, but I'll figure all that out later. Now I'm going to make cylinders and hexagonal recesses. So I'm going to go over to the sketch menu and I'm going to click circle and I assume I just click down on the grid and yep it's starting to draw a circle. Now I know from memory how big I need this to be so it looks like I'm going to have to enter that manually in order for a quarter inch bolt to pass through with a little bit of wiggle so it doesn't scratch the edges every time someone pushes it through needs to be a 0.30 inches. Let's exit sketching and let me see if I can extrude that into a cylinder. Yep. So I select the top face of that circle, drag upward. Boom. Now I've got a bolt. Now let's see how I change diameter. I bet I select. Yep. I selected the main tube so when I select the face, it's kind of counterintuitive, but I'll get used to it. The face where I drag up and down shows me the dimension of height, whereas this right here shows me the dimension of width. And it's 0.28, so it's very close. I'm going to do 0 0.30. And now that's the diameter of my circle. Perfect. Now I need to do a hexagon. How do I do that? Oh, polygon, and it's already set to hexagon. I bet this is like Adobe if I click and hold or maybe right click. Yep, we get different polygon options. But I'll leave it on hexagon, so let me select that. Probably the same deal. Yep, there we go. And it looks like it's allowing me to rotate it and it's kind of snapping to the grid. So I'm going to do, this is the orientation I'd need. And it needs to be, exit the sketch, select the top face, drag it up to give it some height. And I know it needs to also be 0.3 in that dimension. That should do the trick. So let's do an alignment. I'm going to select a one face. Then I'm going to do an align. And I'm going to align the center of that to the center of that. And there we go. Looks like a little hex bolt. There's still a little bit I haven't figured out here. It's kind of confusing, but as long as I'm able to work and produce something that works, that's all I care about. Let's select that. Let's move that over. All right. So now I need to copy this puppy because I make four bolt holes and I need to make four of these and align them. 
So I'm going to select my hex bolt punch, which is that entire object. So let's do mirror. Select that. Yeah, that's that's not what I want. There's got to be a better way other than mirror to accomplish what I want to do. So I'm going to go do a Google search real quick. Shaper. Copying bodies. So I'm going to sit through this video and I'll be right back. It's actually a lot easier than I was making it. You select the body over here. So I'm going to select my hex bolt and then we get these controls. It's literally a copy function. As soon as you click copy and it becomes blue and it's activated, now when you drag over, you get a duplicate of the object. So I'm going to place that and I'm going to click away, deselect all, and now I've got two objects. I bet you I can do that same thing with both of those selected. So now I've got hex bolt, hex bolt punch and hex bolt punch one, and I'm gonna retitle that hex bolt punch two. And now let's highlight both of them, and I'm gonna do the same thing. And I betcha, yep, I copied both at the same time. So now I'm going to click away, deselect, and I've got my four bolts. So let's retitle those. I'm gonna do hex bolt punch three and hex bolt punch four. Now I'm gonna select all of them and move them as a group. And I'm going to change the position of two of them. And let's move those further out to the side. As of right now, my only immediate problem is how to perfectly align all four of those. And I'll figure that out uh, here in the next week or two. To give you an idea of what I'm going to do, I'm going to take the lower body and the upper body, select them both at the same time, drag them up. So now I'm going to just select the lower body, move it down a bit. Let's make sure all my holes are in alignment and you can see it's kind of eating into the lip. So I need to change the position of these slightly. So I'm going to move them slightly in. To do that, I select bolt hole punch one and bolt hole punch three. Let's move those in to where they're no longer hitting the sides. I'm going to select them individually. Move that slightly that way. Select bolt hole punch three, move it slightly that way, and then let's take a look on the inside and make sure they have cleared. Yep, that's the main thing I wanted. I wanted clearance so that it didn't touch that side lip. Just giving it a casual look around. Looks like that's going to be how I want it. So now I need to do a subtract function. And I'm going to try to subtract all of those at the same time. There we go. So that looks like it's going to do what I want it to do. I'm going to hit done. Boom, it punched a hole through both of my cigar halves. It left a hexagonal recess. And that's all, folks. That's the basic creation of a Canagar Tools Canagar mold. Well, it's looking like this software might be completely viable as a replacement for Morphe. Time will tell in the next couple weeks if I can get used to it and get to the point where I can work just as fast as I was able in Morphe. But I hope this helps you guys. Uh, there's lots of different software out there that you can try. But so far, out of all the ones that I've tried, very, very solid. So the last step would be to change this into a 3D printable file. So now I'm going to try to figure out how to export this file. Go to File, Export, and there we go. Yeah, 3D print, export for a slicer, click Next, Standard Triangle Language. I'm not familiar with 3MF, so I'm going to do STL, the standard format, and stay with STL. So let's give it a name, Cigar Mold Template resolution I'm gonna say hi although it says that's for pro only that is one major difference guys Morphe was 10 bucks and then you just had access to it this is a monthly cost and probably a little bit more expensive than Morphe and a little bit more professional I'm gonna just keep it the way it is I'm not I'm not familiar with these kind of STL export settings you can't export until you've either started a free trial or you've started your 
Looks like $39 a month or $2.99 a year. So I'm going to have to sign up for a subscription, then I'll be able to export. I didn't mean for it to take so long to finally get around to finishing these videos, but I've been doing some stuff the last few months. Let's backtrack to when I first started my business to what my day actually looked like. Like, if I had an ideal day, what would that be? Well, I'd wake up in the morning, have my coffee from about 5 to 6. I wake up that early. You don't have to, of course. But then I would maybe go out for a jog or go out and have a cigar. I would start working at around 7. Which for me, that means going into my print lab. I had, um, at the, the height of me running a lab in my garage, I had 12 machines. Two really large format machines. Two machines dedicated to uh, a different type of filament TPU for a, a side product I was doing that became a main product. And then my normal five machines, or six machines, that became you know the mainstay of my production. And those would be producing the cigar molds all day. So I would wake up, go through my kind of getting ready, and then by the time I hit the print lab, I would take all the prints from the previous day off of the platform because you'd have, I'd have finished prints sitting there. And I've designed my models in such a way that I don't have to do any hand finishing. Not all products are going to be like that. Some products you'll just have to do some hand finishing. With cigar molds, I was able to stand them vertically and control all the angles to where they pretty much pop right off the printer ready to ship. That saved me a lot of time. When I first started, it wasn't that way. I had little breakaways. I had a lot of little things that I had to clean and a bunch of inconsistencies. And after about the first six months to a year, I worked through that, found the plastic, found the right settings on the computer, found the right way to design my particular models so that I didn't have to do any hand cleaning. And boom, I saved myself like hours of work right there. And so once I had that done, my morning looked like coming in, taking all the previous finished prints that I had started yesterday off the printer, prepping the printer for another print, getting those prints started, and then if there were any orders that were now complete and ready to ship, I box them up, ship them out. Usually took me maybe about an hour to remove all the prints and get new prints started. And then after that, it took me about an additional hour, sometimes an hour and a half or two, to complete all the shipping. So there was my two and a half, three hour workday. And because the models that I had selected to sell are so large, they take like 18 hours to print. What that means is when I get them started, my job with the printers is done. It's not like having small objects where if you're printing one small object, but say you can only print a limited number of them on the size bed you have, you're probably creating work for yourself because you're going to actually have to go in there and change out the prints to increase how many you can crank out and to actually speed up your production. For cigar molds, fortunately for me, those always run overnight. So once I get them started, my job is done with 3D printing. Um, so that's another helpful tip that you might consider is the size of your product or being able to load up your print bed. Let's say you choose something small, but you still have a big print bed. You might still have a 12 to 18 hour print if you know you have them densely clustered and it's building them all at once. There are ways to kind of create this workflow for yourself. And that's it. That's what my 3D printing ideal day was when I finally had everything tuned in. Um, one big tip, 3D printers also need maintenance. By far, they are some of the most maintenance-free things I've ever had to deal with. Like, there is no comparison between trying to run a CNC shop or some other kind of machining and 3D printing. Not at all. Once I got my tungsten nozzles for my 3D printer... I was off to the races. Those are nozzles that don't wear down. So as long as I keep my printers in tip-top shape, uh, which is relatively easy to do, by the way, they kind of take care of themselves, you're good to go. So my maintenance schedule, and, and at first I didn't really know this, like a machine would break down, I'd have to deal with it. And that's another thing I got tired of is like, if you let your machines just run until one breaks down, eventually you're going to have work for yourself that will start to pile up. So what I did is I made one day each quarter where I would spend a full eight hour day, literally going into each printer, tuning it, replacing the parts that might need replacing, cleaning it up, 
oiling it and greasing it because they have these bars, you know, like bearings and such like that. And if you do that, if you're on top of your maintenance for your machines, I mean, they're, they're almost flawless. Like I've got two robos in my, in my room next door. I've drastically reduced print lab right now. Um, but those machines have been running for five years and I have only replaced like stepper motors or, uh, you know, various little wiring parts, but nothing major. Total cost of maintenance on each printer might have been like 50 to 100 bucks, to be honest. So if you choose the right printer and you get your maintenance schedule down, you reduce your workload. Another big tip that I have is to choose the right accessories and you will save yourself a lot of time. Probably the accessory that has saved me more time than my tungsten nozzles is this. It's a spatula. The build tax spatula. Really, this thing is, it has saved so many prints. So if you're rolling on a glass bed or you've just got a, a basically a, a completely fixed flat bed as opposed to something that can flex or some of those fancier things, this will save you lots of headache and lots of money. Before I had this thing and I was rocking on the Robo R1, which had a glass print bed, every now and then when I was trying to remove a cigar mold, it would actually break the glass bed. And that just, that got to me, you know, like I hated that. Anything with a big flat surface area was a danger of actually damaging the printer. And so the normal, you know, little scrapers that they give you with a 3D printer just didn't do the trick. This does it every time. And what you do is you put it up underneath the corner of the print, just kind of wedge it in there. It's got a very, very flat, sharp edge. Once you get it underneath, you just kind of bump it with your hand and it'll get it completely underneath it and boop, you can save yourself. Now, I don't know, maybe I should make a video about this thing itself, but basically you'd go all around the part, not just from one side, but once you get it completely under from one side, go completely under from there, completely under from there until you have loosened the entire bottom and you will save your print and save your print bed every time. What I've gone over today, establish a routine, Set up your prints to take eight plus hours so you aren't having to babysit your prints all day and change them. Regular maintenance will save headaches and your build tax spatula will save so many prints that you're definitely going to thank me later. So I hope this video has helped you. Don't forget to smash the like and subscribe. Stay tuned for my next video where I'm going to show you how I automated my fulfillment with a free shipping software. And this is the video you've probably been waiting for, where I show you how I automated my fulfillment for my 3D print lab. In the previous video for this series, I walked you through a day in my print lab when I was doing fulfillment at home and how I would maximize my day. In this video, I'm going to show you how I automated my fulfillment so that I no longer had to 3D print at home. Well, I should, I should give a big exception. I still do custom work at home, so when I get custom 3D print jobs that I have to sit down and design, then I produce them in my own 3D print lab. But outside of that, all the items that I have designed and ready to go are now fulfilled by a third-party printing partner. You know, this video has been a long time in the making, not because it's that difficult to make or has that much information, but because I didn't really know how to approach it. In my fulfillment, I solved a problem that I was having, which might not apply to everybody out there that wants to start a 3D printing related business. My problem was very specific. When I was originally looking to automate my fulfillment, my original problem was, okay, I have a product that is too big and too massive for me to have other 3D print labs that are mainstream really crank it out for me. They're charging me too much. It doesn't pair up with the price that I need to use. So I actually had to go out of my way to find a partner that was basically a guy like me running his own lab, which led immediately to the second problem, which is I get orders. How do I send those orders over to my printing partner without having to manually do it myself, like compile emails with the orders, send that over? So I was trying to figure out a way to automate that. And before I knew about make.com or anything like that, I was investigating maybe paying a developer to develop like a Zapier connection or something like that. Then I had a light bulb go off one day and I'm so glad I did because I got to apply one of my favorite axioms, keep it simple, stupid. I use a shipping software, and 
If you look at my screen, that's exactly what I'm using, Pirate Ship. They have been incredibly useful for several different reasons. One of them being that it's absolutely free. There's no membership cost. Pirate Ship has allowed me to have multiple different from addresses. I've been able to use this service for free and I get access to the same rates that you get with like Shipping Easy or ship station all of the the kind of big shipping plugins i don't see a difference in the rates and i have friends that use the other and i compare to mine it's the same rates only i don't have to pay for a monthly account and what was my light bulb moment instead of having some software created to to make our systems talk or to even automate emails with the order content which might have been easier what i ultimately opted to do was tell them about pirate ship ask them to create a free account because it doesn't cost them to create account and then they were able to log in view all of my orders because I just had the plugin installed to my website so if you have WooCommerce or if you have Shopify it's just a plugin once the plugin is installed all your orders will automatically be visible in pirate ship so I'm gonna go ahead and log in and say you have orders on deck or waiting to be processed you're going to see them I didn't have to reinvent something or do something special they were just able to log in and see my orders and to make this work and make it practical in 3D printing, the only thing I really had to do, I had already given them all of my files. The last step was to make sure that the naming was correct, and it wasn't, so I had to actually go in and make sure that all my items were titled the exact same title as the file that my 3D printer partner you know, had. That way when they see the orders, those things match up. Once I did that, it was just done. It was like we didn't need any automations, we didn't need any special software, they just log in there and that's where they not only view my orders and know what to crank out, but they generate the shipping labels on their end and ship. And then they'd send me an invoice at every Friday and I'd settle up. I encourage you to check out Pirate Ship. I don't get any affiliate income. They don't have an affiliate portal or anything like that. I just found it incredibly useful. That is how I automated my fulfillment. I'm not sure that that quite applies to everybody. If you design a bunch of cool stuff and you want to get it out there, there are a few cool ass websites that allow you to upload your objects and sell them in a marketplace. So I've only used one of these, but I'm going to show you several that I've heard good things about. The one that I have used is called Shapeways. Like a lot of other things, you create an account, click over on, see on the menu bar, it has Marketplace to the far right hand side, click on that, and you upload your objects, and people have the ability to browse these things, and then they can order them. Let's see, let's, let's look in the meme section and see what fun stuff they have. Oh, who doesn't want a grumpy cat Christmas ornament? So you get to choose your material, Anyone who wants can contact you, like if they want to customize it or just have questions about it. And that's it. You upload your objects, and this 3D printing service actually prints it and will ship it to your customers. Chris, if it's that easy, why don't you just use Shapeways to sell your cigar molds? Good question. Look at the price of this Christmas ornament right here, $37.78. While I might be willing to do that for the novelty of having Grumpy Kitty on my Christmas tree, I'm not necessarily willing to do that for other everyday practical items. My cigar molds, if you look in the cigar mold industry, just in tobacco or even cannabis, they average around $100 for a professional cigar mold, and that's the big full-size units. My competition sells an aircraft machined aluminum that is... You know, I consider it like the MacBook Pro of my market niche, but they sell it for 130 How much did it cost when I uploaded my cigar molds to Shapeways? Let's take a look. Up in the top right hand side of the screen, I'm going to click the little red button that says get a quote, and we're going to upload my file and see what they're going to charge me to print it. Very easy for you to upload your own models and get a, a quick snapshot of what you should expect your pricing to be. And as soon as it gets this file ready, we select a material, choose options, and we'll get our pricing. And as you can see, no matter what I select, my starting price is $428, which for a prototype or for certain functional parts, like if you're designing something that can actually command that price, this makes sense. I'm selling these on my website for $69 because I'm trying to have a better price than my competition that makes a metal product, but also, it, it, like, I couldn't upcharge anything. Like, so this website simply does not work for the product that I'm selling, and that's why I wanted to show you this. 
So in my particular use case, I couldn't use a 3D print service to fulfill any of my orders. I actually had to put out feelers on Craigslist and a bunch of different marketplaces until I actually found a guy who runs a small lab and he was willing to work with me personally and it's not a website, it's not like a big service or anything like that and that's what I had to find. Uh, just basically somebody else out there 3D printing who saw how much I was selling was like, okay, I'll take on this load. This might be worth my time. And sure enough, it's been a great relationship ever since. We also have, what is this one? Yeah, Colts 3D. So this one just came across my feed like a couple months ago, and it looks really promising. So while I haven't used this one, it's just another example of a website that is centered around 3D print fulfillment that is not only a marketplace where you can create listings and sell those items, but it's a place that's going to crank out the items for you and ship them. And that more or less concludes the meat and potatoes of my 3D print business from home series. Now I'm just going to add videos that amount to cool tips and tricks and cool insights. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this video and found it useful. And I hope you did find it useful. I wish you all the success in the world in your 3D printing endeavors onward and upward.